Museum and Boy at Home. It's nice to have all of you join us this Sunday afternoon. Um, in June, we opened a new exhibit called World War II Remembered, uh, Leaders, Heroes, and Battles. And this program is a complement to that exhibit. Our director, Carl Weisenbach, Carl's in the back, wave Carl. Um, his vision is for us to do programming throughout these next three years that supplement um, what was going on during the war. And I had the opportunity to discuss with Phil Black recently uh, something, a pro project he was doing, and I said, that's perfect. So um, Phil and I have been corresponding back and forth for uh, a number of weeks now. And uh, I'm glad that he was able to finish the video and that Leo and Lillian were able to come and join us today. And we invite all of you to come to the courtyard afterwards for a special treat for Leo. Um, we're not going to tell you what it is, you just have to come there to find out. Um, Phil Black is vice pres president of the school board, USD 305 in Salina. And he's had a varied career, but I think one of the things that Phil enjoys most is his independent film producing career for Access TV in Salina. He's done a number of award-winning programs and really enjoys doing that. And so I'm going to turn it over to Phil and let him tell you a little bit about how this project came into being. Phil? Hi. Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting over a coal here, so um, I appreciate everybody coming out. Uh, the thing, I gotta, I've got to call, make, call attention to Community Access Television. First of all, because they train people for $40 or $50 and, uh, through all of the training. And uh, if you do a production, then they'll, let you, they'll waive the fees for that even. So it's a great resource for Salina in the area, actually. Um, secondly, uh, because I made the connection here with Linda Smith, and it was, a, it was one of those events that I went to, and I actually won an award. I, I typically did not. It was my big award right there. And, I, and they called me and said, you might want to show up. You know, I thought, well, okay, I can do that for an award. So I did, and I got to talking with her afterwards. She's a board member, and I had been a board member. And I mentioned this story that we had had going here with Lillian and Leo, and she said, you've got to do this video. So that was the, the second call out to Community Access. The third thing is, as of this time, 24 hours ago, after 50 or 60 hours of editing, and hours of footage and driving to Lamb Passes, Texas and so forth, I had no video. Because in my, when we decided to put it out here, kind of elevated it a little bit for me, and I thought I better get serious about this. And I did, I got to the point where I was gonna convert the file to a DVD and it wouldn't do it. I kept getting errors. So when you have different versions of software, you can go on the internet and, and get what they call patches, which is more software to kind of fix the problem, right? So I fixed the problem only to find out that it didn't find any of my files. So all of a sudden I had no video, no pictures, no nothing. And I was just, oh no, this is 20. I thought Leo, I told my brother, I thought Leo and I are gonna have to do an hour and a half of improv. Uh, <laughs> and he could do it too. But uh, uh, in the end, thank goodness that Aaron at Community Access uh, Television spent three hours and he fixed the video. So that, that it worked out. In 2009, I shot footage inside of a flying B a B-17. Collings Foundation brings out, uh, they brought out a, a B-17, a B-24, and a P-51. And am I losing sound? Is, I, I don't know if we've got a microphone, I'm missing a battery, it's coming in and out. Okay, so I'll, I'll, it's, if it's distorting, that means we're losing the battery. So we'll get another battery. Can you hear me if I yell real loud? Yeah. Yeah. We'll do that for now. But we want to get this fixed before we're done. So, um, I went up with the B-17, I paid the $400, really didn't know why, except I thought it was a neat aircraft, right? And uh, <laughs> that's what it sounded like. And when I got done, I looked at the footage, and when you do editing a video, you, you look for things that are kind of, uh, in common that keep coming out, and they, they become thematic. And from that, you get a story. Well, I knew that these guys had gone up in these B-17s, and some of them were 18, 17 years old, probably knew that only a fourth of them were coming back on some missions. And, but the, the footage I shot told me nothing. So I put it aside thinking I'll tell the story later. In the meantime, I, I became friends with a couple in Salina called, uh, their name is uh, Russ and Jackie Jones, and I don't think Jackie made it here today. Russell um, helped 
helped, they helped me with my campaign for school board, and he always wore this hat, Marine Corps hat. And he was a Marine Corps guy all the way through. And uh, when I, I got to know Russell, I asked him, what, what did you do in the Marines? And he said he was on Iwo Jima. And I thought, Iwo Jima, you're kidding me. I mean, I, I had read about it in textbooks, and I'd seen John Wayne movies. But, you know, I'd never met somebody. And so I determined at that point, I want to try to tell his story. Well, part of his story is that he had received a shrapnel wound from a mortar attack. He was in a machine gun crew, and, his, and it was in his lungs. Now, Russ was one of these guys. He was, he was a triathlete. He was a decathlete in his 60s and 70s. And then on a ski trip on the way back, his lung collapsed. And from that point on, it, it began a, a long, slow demise, basically. And in, in the end, it was the complications from that that caused him to pass away in January. So I went over to Jackie's house to help her get some of his bicycle stuff out, because I'm into bicycling. And I saw that hat, and I asked if I couldn't take that with me. Maybe it was a little bit brazen of me. But she said, absolutely, but I want you to wear it. So I got to wear it, but the beauty of it is, is that uh, people will occasionally ask me, well, did you serve? And Opie, the guy back there who's running the sound, asked me, did you serve? And I said, no, I didn't, but I got some stories, I can tell you. And that's part of the deal. Um, and I should say that Russ, uh, one of his, one of, my, one of I've gotten from listening to Leo's story and Freddie Simons from the Freddie's Frozen Custard and Steak Burger, uh, you see all these World War II pictures, Freddie, had this great little vignette, I'm sorry, I'm tripping over chairs here, had a great little story where he was caught behind the lines and he was he had no more supplies and he said, well, I used to go hunting and fishing all the time and I was some, with some old guys, old boys from Texas and we just, we made some tea and we made it work and it was just, it was kind of a, a little bit of humanity in the inhumanity of war. Uh, for Russ, when he got, when he got the shrapnel wound, the, the corpsman came over and gave him a shot of morphine. But he also gave him two ounces of medicinal brandy. <laughs> he said, it's, it's just some tradition, right? So they got him to the ambulance and left him with, a, with the ambulance driver and another corpsman. The corpsman said, hey, soldier, this guy doesn't have, he didn't get his morphine because they forgot to mark the X on his forehead. And he said, I tried to tell him, but I, I just couldn't hardly talk. So I just said, oh, to hell with it. And they gave him another shot of morphine and another two ounces of medicinal brandy. <laughs> he said, by the time we got down to the beach, I was feeling good. <laughs> he said, if, if this is what dying is, it's, it's not so bad. So these kinds of stories, I think, is what the Eisenhower Library is trying to do. They're trying to show there's more to this. When you read history, and I'm an instruct, college instructor, and you, you tend to look at you know, what dates, what mood, what battalion went where, what was the effects of the war, how did that affect our economy, what does that got to do with oil, all this kind of stuff. But we're missing these great little stories that are still around. So I was terribly, terribly proud to be able to do this. And so when someone says, you know, did you serve? I say, no, but let me tell you a story. Here's a great story of Leo Perkins and a beat that. Remember, dear, a kiss is just a kiss. A sigh is just a sigh The fundamental things apply As time goes by And when two lovers woo They still say I love you On that you can rely No matter what the future brings as time goes by. Moonlight and love songs never out of date. I was born in 1917, right after the First World War, and as I grew up, I knew a lot of our, our neighbors. We lived on ranches, and uh, a lot of neighbors had been in the Army. And I took a picture one day to my dad when I was about seven or eight years old of a cowboy 
and a soldier. I asked him which I'd rather, which would be the best. And he said either one of them was going to be a kind of a rough life. Uh, but then as I went into high school, we was in the middle of the, the de depression. And uh, so I had to work on ranches and things like that. So uh, as I grew up, that's the only life that I knew. Finally wound up being a cowboy, and uh, we got $25 a month for staying out sometimes all month. And as the uh, draft was on in the early 40s, then uh, my number came up and I was working on a ranch. So uh, I decided I didn't want to go into uh, the Army as a cowboy, because I didn't know for that. So I decided on the Air Corps, Army Air Corps. Went to Fort Bliss, Texas when my uh, number came up, or before uh, my number came up, and they gave me a choice of where, what branch of the service I'd like to get into. And I hadn't been to college, but I did graduate from high school. And they said I had to fill out all these papers, and uh, I, they said I could pick my service, whatever, whatever first service, one of the branches service that I wanted to get into. So I stayed at Fort Bliss for uh, about a week, learning how, supposedly, or learning how to march, which I never did really accomplish. It wasn't that much fun. And uh, then I was shipped there to Jefferson Barracks, Missouri, right out of all St. Louis. Just uh, over the fence and I skipped my jump and you could be in St. Louis in about 30 minutes. From there, I was assigned to uh, Airplane Mechanics School in Chanute Field, Illinois. So went up there and it was about halfway through and Pearl Harbor exploded. And uh, they rushed us up to graduate so we could get into action a little faster, I guess. And uh, I went to, uh, from there, to Pendleton Field, Oregon, which was exciting. And we'd fly around the area, and uh, one time there was, a, I noticed on the loading list, there was a Colonel LeMay. And so uh, I thought, well, that'd be a good occupation to follow, because he, was, he made a whole career out of flying and being in the Army. So. Uh, And uh, about that time, they sent two of us to study the B-29, which were just make it in Seattle, the boy it was. And uh, they had three of them, three prototypes, B-29. So after studying that, there were so many things that were an improvement to the B-17 that I thought maybe, perhaps I might get into B-29. But I never did, never knew. I sit back and, and started first phase training in B 17s. We flew around uh, Spokane and then we came on down to Blythe, California, and formed a crew down there. The uh, Third Army was training, getting a lot of desert training out of Wyeth, California. And uh, we were training to drop bombs. And there was a lot of uh, confusion, on, I'm sure, on their part of not understanding 
the uh, significance of uh, our importance in dropping bombs, uh, brave, soften up the enemy before they could get over the, there and do their thing. And there was a lot of discussion about uh, who was the most important, the Army or the Air Corps. And it led into uh, more serious discussion and then finally a little things, things got out of hand. And the MPs came in there and they were, the, they're the people that think they're in control sometimes. And uh, I haven't always had a lot of love for the MPs, but if there's any MPs, I apologize for what trouble I may have caused them. Of course, they moved us on out. They didn't want to keep us up too long. I missed some of the training. I was in jail for fighting the Third Army. I guess it's the first, their major fight. And uh, several, uh, several of us in Air Corps, always tough, I guess, is the Third Army. Give them a little bit of practice, you see, before they went overseas. And uh, next morning, they hauled us back to the base, the Air Corps base in beautiful downtown, no, it's outside the beautiful downtown of Blythe. And uh, they marched us down the road in my squadron commander said, Perkins, I want to see ya. And uh, the guard went and said, no, I'm going to take you to your office. Well, I stopped anyway because he had more rank than I do. He was a major or something. And he said, uh, you're going to be uh, Koenig's engineer, flight engineer. And uh, it was a good time to get to know all this good news because I all night long I've been listening to a lot of other crap. So uh, we trained there flying and, and assigned a co-pilot and then one of my jobs was to train the other flight engineers as they came in. From there we went to the beautiful downtown Pio, Texas. And about all we could do was, was fly. There, and we had about 365 days that we could fly. We didn't stay there that long. We stayed there for a while and went through the training. And uh, then uh, we moved up to Puebla, Colorado. Puebla, Colorado. And uh, there we would practice. Uh, air to air, air to uh, ground tr uh, firing the machine guns. And we all had to be uh, on our toes and uh, the, uh, well, the we flew down, we would fly, even slipped down into New Mexico and just put in, or put in your flight time, which you had to have at least four uh, days a, a month to draw a fly plane. Well, we, we exceeded that. Walter Moran, B-U-R-A-N, was a ball turret gunner on our crew and he and I would uh, get around uh, or go to different places together. Well, we were about to find out. We knew we were going overseas and we wanted uh, to remember these places when we came back. You know, my, you might settle down in some of these places that were congenial and uh, you kind of like the atmosphere and all that. And Pueblo, Colorado was a real nice place. Well, until uh, one night, the MP and a uh, policeman found Buran and I in a place where, in a sort of part of Pueblo that they said we weren't allowed. 
Well, we didn't see any, hadn't seen any signs up or anything like that. So uh, they were pretty aggressive. And Buran was a much calmer person than I was. And so the uh, policeman set him in the uh, jeep and just slapped his face like that. Well, this kind of irritated me, and I suggested to the policeman if he'd take off the gun, well, he, I'd give him a wonderful opportunity to slap my face, because I'd need it worse than Brand did. And so he, gave, he just handed his pistol over to the MP. With the, they were buddies, you know, I'm sure they, I knew, I knew there was no, no win situation here, but I wanted to get my few words in. And so we went at it, and I was as tough as he was. We went around and around, I had him up against the wall. And I drew, drew back to uh, silence him and hit the wall, broke a finger. I said, okay, I'll go. I'll give up for now. And they put us in jail and tried to keep it from the old squadron commander because the next day we were going to come down to Albuquerque, New Mexico and, and shoot some targets along the uh, mountainside. So the flight surgeon put me on a cast and I was able to farm a machine gun and all that. And uh, we got through these training periods pretty, pretty well. We kind of knew our job, they hoped. And uh, then they decided it was about time to go overseas. So we went up to, through Kansas, Salina, Kansas. And that was a dry town. Maybe the whole state of Kansas was dry. I can't remember. And anyhow, we did uh, stay there. It was a very flat country, seemed to me like. Well, we were flying, our base was in Pio, and it was pretty level country there, but we would get out to the mountains occasionally, but I can't remember seeing any mountains in Kansas. Salina was our last stopping point you know, until we got to Bangor, Maine. I remember an incident. I didn't trust the uh, people on the ground, so I filled up that B-17 as much gasoline, as much fuel as it would hold. But it, anyway, it's not, as I was filling up the airplane, I got too much in there. And as we took off, it started spraying back. I said, well, I guess I'm overdone it this time. And then when we took off, see the whole crew flew, we all flew in overseas. On our B-17, there was ten, 10 of us. There were four officers and six enlisted men. We had the, up front, where I was, was a pilot, the co-pilot, the bombardier, and the navigator. We were all up front, in front of the uh, Bombay section. And just at the back of the Bombay section, it's the radio operator, the two waist gunners, and the ball turret, and then the tail gunner was the last man. Yep, up, I had to, uh, well, my, one of my jobs as uh, to fill out a loading list, get every man's name, rank, and serial number, and he give to the, uh, give to the uh, crew chief. And uh, they had to, and sometimes it, you know, I had to check it, make sure that every man, as he came on her, was on the, the right, had every, all his information. And then I had to uh, tell the pilot all the doors were closed. And uh, this, this was it. Most of us all got in the plane from the back from the side toward the rear. And then I would I would check and make sure that the ball turret was in place. 
and uh, the, the crew was all there They'd go on up to the pilot and tell him what he needed to know or a little bit I knew and uh, I was, I was my, part of my job was just take care of everything in flight that was of a, a mechanical nature. My uh, original uh, radio operator and I were the same age, but if you were scheduling and preparing for flights, you'd change around. A pilot was a lot younger than I was, and we had one guy that was 32 on a plane, he was an old man, and one of my, my uh, of the waist gunners was 29. And I was 24 when we started flying, and I had, by the time I got, when I got shot down, I think I was 25. I believe I had my 25th birthday in the um, POW account. It'll come to me later. So a lot of things will probably come to me later, but I won't be able to tell you about it, send you back a message. Because in 95, some of the things come out a little bit different than I had anticipated. And then went on to Bangor, Maine. And from there we went to uh, Bangor Lake. We landed there and then flew to, to uh, Presswick, Scotland. Stayed there for a couple of days and then went to Ridgewell, England. And uh, it's in Essex County. And it, it wasn't it was a few days until we got uh, our first mission. Oh, shoot, I think I had to thing on standby. How about that? Hell yeah, we had to. Amazing. And it was to France. And we were bombing the airfield in France. And uh, we got into a lot of, little bit of flack, and we had a fighter escort to go with us. Then after, the, after that, three or four missions, we go further into Germany, and uh, we'd have a escort, fighter escort, of P-47s, and uh, that's the only thing I can think of right now. And then we pick them up at a certain point, and they could only go with us so far because they, they would run out of fuel. And then we always encountered a few uh, German players, Messerschmitts and, and uh, <laughs> the others that I can't think of. And we encountered a lot of flack. Fighter planes didn't bother us while we was in the in the flak, flying over the flak, but uh, it was uh, things got pretty quiet. And uh, I guess the guys had a little time to think: well, are they going to make it or not make it? So about the tenth mission, like that, uh, this. Uh, uh, Waste Gunner Jones, he was 29 years old, he said, uh, Perkins, I'm going to talk to you. I said, okay, what are you going to talk about? He said, I'm going to get killed and I want you to go see my mother. She lives in Moline, Illinois. I looked at it kind of funny and I thought I misunderstood him. He said, I've written her a a letter that you'll come and see her. I knew he'd need a drink then. I tried to get him on, on with him on a bicycle, which I'd learned to ride in England. I tried to learn. And he said, no, I don't drink. So I pedaled on off. And a few days later, the other waste gunner was 19. He told me about the same story, except his mother lived in Walk, New York. Said so she has ten kids. Said, like for you to go see her. 
I said, you and Jones have really got the idea that you're not going to make it. I said, it's not a blankety blank German's got a bullet with my name on it, because that's the way I felt. I, could, I never allowed myself to uh, think that they get me. After every mission, they'd take us in to interrogate us. Well, there was always a bunch of guys that wanted to be a hero. We had 18 planes that we put up in one, about the, that was the most we ever put up in one day. And you'd always see somebody, uh, they would always have them attacked by uh, fighter planes. And it, with 18 planes, all the uh, 18 top gunners could get a shot at them. And uh, every tenth bullet we had was a tracer. And you could uh, follow it and a, a bounce tracers off the bottom, bottom of them, but you'd never know whether who hit it or anything. And it'd be guys that would stay there for hours trying to convince the uh, interrogators that they had knocked the plane down. Well, I didn't care that much. I didn't. I didn't want to be a hero myself, because I, I, I didn't care whether I got the credit or not. But they give a certain number to, uh, of what they call them. So anyway, credits, I guess, for doing something. I have it up there on my, uh, all, all my medals and all, except the good conduct medal. It keeps falling off. The conduct medal always falls off. We wondered why. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it doesn't have a place there, but or she she puts it on pretty. Well. Norway one time or other flight, and uh, that was a 12 hour flight. And we began to notice this the light would come on, certain tanks were getting big and low on fuel, so I had to adjust the, the uh, fuel from one tank, uh, move from one tank to another. And uh, as a red light would come on, You'd have to make the adjustment. In flight, there wasn't much you could do except uh, you know you make sure that the the uh, props were you know where it weren't windmilling, why it weren't turning. If a, a propeller was rotating you know, at those high altitudes, of course it would freeze up immediately and just fall apart sometimes, they just had pieces would fly off on them. But we had to, had to avoid that. Feathering is stopping the uh, engine and get, getting the, the, uh, the yes. blade adjusted to where it will not catch air and rotate and go around, because what it does, it gets you enormous speed. Uh, going into the wind, straight in, where it didn't. It didn't. We were sent uh, to uh, 
Ridgewell, England, and started flying out of there. Within about three months, or less than three months, nearly three weeks, nearly half of our uh, organization were either prisoners or killed because it was pretty tough. We got over there in uh, 43, about April or May, I can't remember which, and started flying missions over uh, France, Germany, and one to Norway. Oh, oh, Tinker's Toy was one we flew in. That was named. The squadron commander was Ingenhut, and his daughter was Tinker. I think she was born sometime while we was in training. And they called one of oh, the planes that he flew in, Tinker's Toy, was the one that got shot down in. I don't think we had a name for it. At the beginning, we had the same crew, but some guy to get sick or some reason or another, they would do, wouldn't want to fly. Then somebody else would take their place. And uh, that one to Norway was on the longest mission that had been flown to B-17s, and that's when we had a problem with the uh, fuel because we weren't sure. And we had to bomb, we were bombing the sub pins up there, so we just made one run at it and dropped our bombs. But on the way back is when we had to watch coming down over the North Sea and all the German flight airplanes were in after us. And we had to, uh, that's when I had to transfer the fuel from one tank to another. But uh, we landed in three of the red lights were on by the time we hit the runway. So if it had been about 50 miles more, I don't know whether we'd have made it or not. One or two of the planes did uh, fall short and landed on the strips as they got into England. But the uh, white cliffs of Dover are really beautiful when you're coming back and seeing them. There, I never did get over there a foot. I've only got see, I only see them from the air. Oh, uh, I, I bought a bicycle in England because I needed it for transportation, and uh, I needed to learn how to ride my own bicycle instead of somebody else's. So. We were in this town and heading back toward uh, our base and this kid about 14 or 15 years old, something like that, he was out cutting grass in the uh, road, roadway. We stopped to get acquainted with him. He had a lot of rabbits and things he was cutting grass for. And so we went on home with him and got acquainted with his sister and his mother. Their dad had died uh, several years before and they were uh, strictly English, you see. They were loyal to the Queen and all that, which it took me a long time to realize that this has been going on for generations, you see, and that's their natural way of thinking. They were raised that way. And uh, they were very congenial people. And Joan's boyfriend was in Africa someplace. So uh, she and I got along pretty well. And we did a few things together, rode bicycles together. Then after I got shot down and sent to prison camp, she used to go out to the base to dances and things like that, she told me later. This one guy she got to know a little part quite well, I guess. He told her, said, don't you marry an American? She told me that later. He, he advised her not to, not, not to marry. 
we never did really get serious about it, you know. Cause she had this boyfriend who was coming home pretty quick. Then uh, after I came back, she uh, I don't know, she might uh, might have wrote me two or three letters, but then her mother wrote up and said Joan and Jim married, and they went on the honeymoon up in Scotland. So it didn't, it didn't bother me that much because uh, I had other plans. And it all worked out real good. We went to see them when we went over in 1980 and stayed in their place. They came over to the state that we've seen them a couple of times. Real, real good friends. Jim died a few years ago, but we still stay in contact with Joan. I guess the next, the next exciting thing was on the 19th of August in 1943. We'd have been in combat a little over two months. Two-thirds of the original crew were either killed or captured. But by the end, we had one-third of the original people. One plane went out, uh, I mean not one plane, ten planes went out and uh, how many came back? And two of them came back, <coughs> ten men. So on one raid to uh, a ball bearing factory in, uh, I can't remember the town of the town, Nardell. But anyway, they were a lot of guns to defend it. But they finally leveled it off. We'd never had a, on this ball bearing factory, it never had had a raid on it before. But it was pretty costly. And then the the day that I got shot down, the uh, mission had been scrubbed once. And then before we could scatter out, they called it back. And the colonel said, got his uh, milk run to our field in uh, Holland. Hills Ryan is the name of the place. The lead navigator hit a dummy airfield and our Bombay Dew froze open. We were on the, bo on the bomb run and they froze open and uh, he, uh, and I had to crank them shut. I think we uh, pulled out of formation and I was hit. I can't remember exactly now where we were hit, but the plane just seemed to jump up in the air. Well, I figured it was from flak, I don't know, from the anti-aircraft gun. And uh, about that time, I was shooting the plane at, uh, right above us. We always had to watch it up above because sometimes they would drop bombs into the break up a formation our formations, and then we kept them pretty uh, much to one side. And, uh, and several times, especially that day, I was bouncing tracers off their belly. But they have a, a uh, steel bottom they found out later, you know, and you, weren't, you weren't doing much good unless you hit them in a kind of a vital spot. But anyway, back to where the day I got shot down, uh, when I think the Bombay doors closed, they had already sal salvoed the bombs because you just cut them loose wherever you have to because you don't want to be hit had a load of bombs. It's so dangerous. So uh, I was cranking up the Bombay doors, and uh, I was away from the intercom. Didn't have it with me, and I had to take off my chest pack parachute to reach the. the 
crank and uh, then I noticed the cabin was all full of smoke. So since I got a crank, I grabbed a fire extinguisher and uh, I was about maybe 10 or 15 feet back from my cockpit area. And uh, there was one guy left there and it was his first mission with us. And uh, he uh, he just tried to tell me something when and we, we got a whole shot in our gas to try to, is it sure too noisy? Finally, he just waved his hand and jumped out. Well, I went up to the uh, nose to check on the navigator and the bombardier, and that's all gone. And the number three in, in line, in, in, Number three engine on the right side was on fire, and the smoke was, smoke was coming out, and the flame was uh, almost over the gas tanks. So I went by and uh, discovered I needed my parachute. So I went and got it and threw it on the hooks, and it got upside down, and that was through the. Uh, the rip cord of the, the handle on my left hand, I'm naturally right-handed. That was the only concern that I had. I had to train to uh, learn to throw it on my, uh, the, uh, the chest pack is what I wore, and I had no instructions on what to do or how to land that I can remember of. They may have just told you, now watch where you're going to land, which I wasn't doing the day I landed. I looked at the altimeter and I believe it was 26,000. I got on something here, 24,000. Well, we had just pulled out of formation when we got hit. And uh, so I uh, bailed out. And uh, I'd run out of oxygen one time over Creole, and uh, my oxygen froze up. And there was a colonel flying with him as, as an observer, and I just slumped down in the turret there. And he saw the problem, and he got, got me on oxygen again. It was just like one of the original TVs. It just gradually faded out. And then, same, same, same way, when I got a shot of oxygen, everything got back to normal. So after that, I carried one of these bailout bottles and I stripped on my leg, and uh, just in case I needed it. And uh, I didn't, I got came down between the formation and uh, the anti aircraft on the ground, and you could hear those bullets whizzing by. Uh, I hope they weren't shooting at me. I saw one guy landing as I was landing, and uh, found out later it was a radio operator. He said he bailed, he was the first in out, oh, and uh, I guess he's a First to hit, but I was right behind him because I waited till I got way down low for a ripcord, took on a shot of oxygen, figured I'd make it. I was looking off and hollering for a place to run. I was coming right down over a big body of water and uh, got to checking around and I had misplaced my May West someplace. And they, but about that time, a breeze came by and blew me inland, and I was about a quarter mile from the, this body of water. And uh, looked off for a place to run, and about that time I hit the ground. I broke some ribs and sprained the an ankle. And uh, before I could get out of the parachute, some uh, young people that were working on a farm, they gathered all around there, and that parachute disappeared real fast. They had, 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 had to silk in a long time. 
pretty soon they started going back to work, stop here and there. Where the truth is just one more guy and myself walking along this canal like deal. Was that a did they have a drainage problem over there? And like in El Paso, we got the irrigation ditches. You had to walk for about a half mile to get it across one. And it was still daylight at 10 or 11 o'clock. And this time, the guy went left. Nobody invited me home for supper. So I just stayed out there. And after it got a little bit darker, I moved it on to across the way. And uh, there was a hog pen there. One old hog was in there. Well, I got up fairly close to the pen, and I thought, well, this would be a pretty good place because uh, they'd never look for an American in the hog pen, they I thought maybe. At midnight, two girls came by, and I got their attention. Uh, and uh, what I'm told, they said, don't go to any of these houses. said, the Germans have been uh, to our house twice. They said, there's one American they can't account for. And, uh, and uh, so I knew not, not to get on the road, stay away. And I walked about a half a mile and I found a big old field. It had lots of high stacks in it. And I picked out a good looking one there. I thought it'd be real comfortable for the lot of night. And I went in there and kind of made the be in that bed out of straw and passed off till the next morning. I heard this guy uh, saying, Guten Morgen, Guten Morgen. Well, I was close to uh, Buenos Dias or Good Morning. So I called him over there and well, he was just tickled to death to see me. And uh, I told him in my broken English and Spanish, I needed some more clothes and some food. I was getting kind of hungry a little. And he said, good, good, and covered my, stopped up my uh, entrance with hay. And uh, I stayed right there and waited for him like a dummy. I should have got, got over to the next straw, straw pile. I heard somebody scratching the hay around, and I could just taste the breakfast he's giving me. And looked up, and here was a man that got that far from my nose, and on the end of the rifle, and there's two German soldiers on the end of the rifle. And what I'm said in English, for you, the war is over. Well, I didn't put up much of a fight there. So I went on out with them and crawled out. And they, they have these hold on to a bicycle to get into a field, a hospital like deal they had there. And they taped up my ankle and ribs and uh, gave me a bite to eat. And this German uh, captain gave me a bottle of Pilsner beer. I thought it was kind of strange, you know, that, but I, I, I didn't think it was going to be that good to me, you know, give me one of those every day. So I had been in England and while I observed these what, English farmers, they go into a pub and they'll drink for an hour on, on one bottle. With the crazy Americans, we just gulp it down and get another one or two. So I enjoyed this one. And uh, it was 38 years later before I had another one. But they're pretty good. Used to, uh, on, on almost every mission that I can remember, you would see some plane get hit. Sometimes you'd see a bunch of chutes open up and sometimes you would see one. So one of my crews, no man got out of it, so I can't imagine how come no one got it. It must have exploded with the bombs in it or something. I have no idea what it did. But none of the crew ever showed up in a prison camp, nor never showed up any place with the underground. They used to tell us that if you could be out 36 hours, the underground can pick you up. I had uh, my original 
radio operator, Tom Moore from Virginia. He got shot down, I guess, two days before I did. He stayed with the underground for over a year, and he went through some real hardships. He said he had to do over again. <laughs> he, he even never joined them. They tried to do the best they could, but some of them, and he suffered and, and died at an early age just from his exposure and all that. Because he had stayed out one whole winter, moved, he's moving him around from one place to another. Kept me around there that evening, and a pickup came by with four coffins in it. I knew when I got in, they put me in the back with the coffins. I knew it was my crew. It was just something told me that I'm part of my crew. Well, I knew everybody got down the front, so I, it was six, five in the back. And the radio robber, that was him landing when I would hit the ground. And uh, they had a mean looking German guard, and he kept a rifle pointed at me. I guess he thought I was running, but I don't know where I could run. We went into a building in the jail. And he threw four big old brown envelopes down. Then he left. Well, I just went through all these, and it was three of my crew that had one dog tag in it, or, I mean, in each envelope. And one didn't have anything. And I, can't, and I knew who it had to be. It was Everett from uh, Walcott, New York. And uh, we had, uh, as we came out to that jail, we unloaded those coffins in Rotterdam Cemetery. And just three of them had dog tags. And then they kept me in jail there in Rotterdam that one night. And the next day they put me on a, on a train with the same guard and we went to Amsterdam. I stayed in Amsterdam about 10 days to be interrogated and, and tried to, they wanted to find out Everett's uh, rank. That was the thing they wanted to find out. She told me that I had been, that I was Keenig, who was my engineer, I mean a pilot, that I was Keenig's engineer and top turret gunner. They knew more as much about me as I knew about myself. And so uh, after about 10 days in Amsterdam, I went up to Frankfurt and stayed in their nice jail there for a few days. And uh, then from there I went into Stalag 7A at Moosburg, right out of uh, Munich. Stayed there and one night after about a month, I guess as I shot down, something happened. I fell out of the darn bunk. When the guys at the uh, next morning, the roll call, they said, what happened to you last night? And I said, I didn't know it. About that time, I fell over again. Well, I kept having those fits. I just passed out. My hand would get cold and right. Right, a hand, right arm and hand, come up here and just knock you out. I finally went to a German doctor. He didn't know what he had said. This German doctor said, if you had an R&R, &R, and, and he had explained it to me what it was because I wrote it rotation and the rest, I think. And I never had had any of that. He said, you're just over, over uh, excited and all this stuff, you know. And so this went on for a while over a year, and then 50 years later, they determined that I had had a heart attack. I said, if I had one, I've had 50 of them. And they, and they, looked, they checked me and they said, there's scars on your, on your heart that can show that you had all these. Well, I just wanted to get a point across that sometimes if you don't know these things, you do better than, much better than if you knew them. 
because when I came back, nobody ever picked it up. Went to, a, I told Lillian after I came back what, what had happened, and we went to see a big doctor there in Alpine, and he said, I, w I don't know what the problem is. said, I'll go back into the Army. They give you shots and all that, and I wasn't really ever looking forward to a shot. And uh, so they didn't know. He said to me, if it was in your left arm, it'd be a heart attack, baby. But in your right arm, it wouldn't be. And so I just never thought I had a heart attack. So they told me about 50 years later that I had. Well, I got settled down in this, uh, from uh, Munich, we rode just the box cars over to uh, Krims, Austria, which was Stalag 17B. And uh, the night we got in there, it must have been about in November, October or November. Well, uh, we got settled down there and I had another one of those pass out, heart attack now, see so if I do. And uh, anyway, got pretty good treatment there in uh, Stalag 17. Every morning they bring us a half of a key, uh, uh, a half a barrel of hot water. And we had a few groceries, but they give us a, about three times a week. They give us a bread ration, or a, and a potato ration, and they keep those things, you know, eat on them. And then uh, they give us some German coffee they call it the Ersatz, and uh, we survive on that. And uh, as a sergeant, didn't, didn't have to work any. The time would have passed off a lot sooner if I had. We had two or three people that saw different kinds of classes. We had a Philadelphia lawyer there. He taught business law. And it was interesting. And we had an, uh, one, Johnny Guterres, he taught Spanish. And I took over that every course that he'd offered. So I'm um, growing up in an on a ranch and living on the border. I spoke some Spanish, but it's all pertaining to the ranch work and things like that. Well, uh, when I came back, I showed him. He made some diplomas. Went uh, took for a year, almost a year and a half. They gave me credit, college credit for eight hours. Spanish, and it helped me because after I got out and was in college, it went to Mexico, worked down there for a couple of years, and so it all paid off. Learned some of his Spanish. Life wasn't bad in the prison camp. We were right next door to ten thousand Russians. There was almost 5,000 Americans, and most of the time, most of the time it was all airmen for the first time, and then the others got to come in because they got captured or shot down near that camp. And uh, they called us out twice a day for roll call, morning and night. The food wasn't real good, but I managed. The Russians were uh, treated real badly. All, every rank had to get fall out and work. We'd see them going by our, our compound every morning. Generals on down. They did not belong to the Geneva Convention and uh, for some reason, they never got any Red Cross parcels. We got Red Cross parcels occasionally. It was a pound of uh, powdered milk, a half pound of sugar, and uh, always three to five packs of cigarettes. 
which I didn't smoke, but uh, guys that did, they'd trade you, oh, we got this D-bar, and we had a can of uh, either salmon or bully beef, but when they were, the, the Germans were given to us, they'd always punch a hole in those cans so we couldn't save it up because they always expect us to try to get away. And we dug tunnels. We dug tunnels over into the Russian compound. There, there was, it, was, it was only about 40, 40 feet to it the most had to go there. The reason we had Russian uh, tunnels in the Russian compound so we could uh, get better acquainted with them, I guess. Just to have something to do and confuse the Germans. As the Russians were coming into Vienna back in uh, 45. Seems like that's about the date. The, uh, and nobody knew who Truman was. One guy finally figured out he was from Missouri. He figured out who Truman was. But uh, anyway, with that, in the group, the guards got, the guard got to know you after a while. And I always had plenty of cigarettes because I didn't smoke. You know, we played poker for cigarettes, food. Well, I was going to tell you about the mail. Yeah, the mail. About two months, I think, after I was shot down, I got a letter from home. I was able to write home. And uh, I think it was took about two months to ever get a letter from me. And then they found out my address and they they, my folks would send me a letter, and they found out they could send me a, a kind of a care package deal. And I, I got that in about a couple of months. And uh, his tobacco was such a hot item to every nationality. Well, I got to send two dollars to, to R.J. Reynolds Company and they'd send me a carton of uh, cigarettes. Well, I've told them to change that to Prince Albert in a can because that was a good trading material. The uh, prison life wasn't that bad as far as I was concerned, because having lived on a ranch all my life, I could survive. The guys from uh, Chicago and other places, you hear a lot of complaining about the food. But uh, we got a few Red Cross parcels, a few Red Cross parcels and uh, help. Always in that Red Cross parcel, there was a pound of oleomargarine, which I never cultivated a taste for, but they were real good to make you a light out of. You, you'd, plant a, you'd take some cloth and kind of plant it together and dip it in this oleomargarine and get saturated with it, and it made a wonderful we called it the butter lights. We played cards with them, and the guys in the three-story bunks, they complained because they said the, the soot got in their nose and all that. And uh, 
I guess it, guess it did, but we kept playing cards all night. The only one was about as useless an instrument as the people could think of to put in, a, in the package. We'd have a D bar and a little sugar and a little coffee and and uh, it was enough things in there to, for one guy to survive on 10 days. Or you could divide up among 10 men for one day. And we got a few of those through the International Red Cross, which was very, and always three to five packs of cigarettes. Usually good cigarettes. Lucky Strike. Few Chesterfield. Most of them didn't like Chesterfield. I don't know why. It's all the same to me, but I never smoked. My tail gunner used to smoke. I'd keep him in cigarettes. I contributed to his delinquents as much as could, I guess. But that was the most valuable thing there. When we were playing poker, they always had the cigarettes the most valuable thing. Next to D bars and things like that. A few but any time we had a can with uh, bully beef or salmon or anything like that, they'd stick a bayonet in it where we couldn't save them up. But, uh, and then after a week or two, if you want to open up, you just open up the can and you cut that blue stuff off and throw it out. And the Russians would come over there sometime and they'd pick up what we throw away and eat. We would use the uh, oleum sometimes to stop up the the holes in the can that they punctured. The bedding was uh, real comfortable. We had burlap bags as a container, and then we had some straw in there. And it wasn't too bad. You got accustomed to it. It's always slept with all your clothes on in case you had to run and uh, keep warm. It got pretty cold some nights. But I never suffered because somewhere or another we got from these regular army blankets. They had U.S., you know, so we knew these all wool blankets. I don't know, uh, I guess, you know, after all these years, I got to figure out, there kind of had to be some kind of communication through some source. It might have been the International Red Cross. But Germans and Americans, they were uh, kind of buddies, more so, oh, ten times better than, than the Russians. When I'd get out and uh, people were moving toward the American lines instead of waiting there for the Russians. There's two places I went to to trade and they, they wanted me to stay there until the Russians went by. Because they, when we were in uh, Krems, it was only about 25 miles down to Vienna. And as far as I know, that's about as close as the Russians came to by us. They didn't come into that Stalag 17 because all the fellows and I couldn't move. Some of them were sick, and and the camp commander was Ken Kurtenbach. Kurt Kurt he stayed there, and uh, the German doctor asked him to stay in his house because he had two girls, young girls. And he, uh, he and, and the camp commander, we just elected him, uh, he's a sergeant, we elected him to the voting process, that's where we did our no poll tax or anything, but uh, we voted him in. Then I saw him in Albuquerque, and he died as a fellow. But he stayed there and protected them until the Russians went by. Once they saw Americans there, well, they wouldn't mess with it. Fritz was our favorite guard. He came in to raise the thunder. He said, 
Let's calm down. Have a cup of coffee. He said, you crazy Americans said, you never take anything seriously. He said, that's why you can't win a war. So, the next war I get into, I'll, you know, I'll take things pretty seriously. Uh, he'd bring me bread if I ever, if I were needed, and I'd give him cigarettes. He said, in Vienna, a pack of cigarettes is worth $12. Well, I had more to Washington in my blood then than I do now. I said, friends, I got a good deal for you. We'll divide that. You bring me six dollars and I'll give you another pack of cigarettes. He said that he would, but except they wouldn't let him out of the gate. It's taken a, I could give him a, some and he'd break the pack. They were broken pack. He could, he could uh, get out with that, but he couldn't get out. So he said, Maybe we can get you through the hospital and you trade places with one of the workers, Englishmen. English can work. We didn't have any Americans in our camp that could work. He had to, according to the Geneva Convention, if you are a sergeant or above, you didn't have to work. That might have been one reason that we were all sergeants. I don't know. It wasn't on good behavior, I'm sure of that. And uh, he said, you trade places with the Englishman. So the English chaplain came over one time and I gave him 200 packs in a shoebox full. And uh, I told him to hold them, use, take what he wanted, and uh, I'd be over in the English compound and since we worked out this deal. Well. A couple of Sundays went by and he never did show up again. Then another one came over and I said, where is uh, Father so-and-so? He said, oh, they moved him out last week. I said, did he leave a package there with my name on it? He said, no, I haven't seen it. So I guess it went to a worthy cause anyway. Plus, plus 200 packs. <laughs> Some of the guards we had had been on the Russian front. And if they give us a lot of static, we'd invite them back toward the Amer the Mexico, the Russian front. Forget what country we in that. And uh, some of them were wounded, had been wounded, and things like that. But uh, yes, that rule, the German, the cards were quite, I guess, sympathetic toward us because we took pretty good care of them. And then when uh, they started marching us back toward the American lines, the civilians, they were real uh, helpful, beneficial. I uh, would strike up with one farmer. I, I learned enough German to ask for brood and air, eggs, and things like that. And I'd run into a farmer. And boy, it was just being hit. He'd cuss Hitler for all he could think of. He'd meet, we'd go down the road for a ways, and he'd meet his neighbor, and they'd zig heil Hitler. They couldn't even trust one another. Their kids even turned them in the things, see. So they had to all salute Hitler and come in with another German. As we were marching through, I didn't, I didn't try to stay with the group all the time. Anytime I get out, I could. and there were two guys with me. We went to a place one night that was having a party there. Some way we were, as I remember it, we were in the middle of it. And uh, I find out uh, this is a bunch of German officers. Well, they didn't pay attention to us because we, we didn't have them. I guess that we were didn't look like Americans. Right? No one had ever said, except there was a girl. She says, "Follow me." And she took off and followed her. And uh, we could have been killed that night. You see, we didn't even know what it was. At another time, I uh, 
was in this village and it got the night came on and I didn't I wanted to find a, a warm place to sleep. Went to this house and asked them if I could stay. See, uh, so many places over there, they have the barn under the house because the heat from the animals keeps their house warm. And uh, I was there and I had this log book that I've shown you with me. And uh, there was a, uh, a German soldier there. And he asked me uh, where I had been in the army. I told him I'd been in the tanks in North Africa. And, because they didn't like fliegers, flieger flyers, because they, uh, and, and it, then it came, some planes flew over, either English, see the English bombed at night, and we bombed in the daytime. We were the first daylight bombers they had over there. And uh, they got all, all excited, and I went down into the, uh, to the uh, barn down below the house, and, uh, some hay there and there's an old sheep in there. She had a big old lamb that night and it was the biggest darn sheep I ever saw. And uh, next day, well, I got up and moved, moved out to a safer climate. But I, I enjoyed my touring around and getting, getting acquainted with the people because they, were, they knew this thing had to be coming to an end because they knew that the Russians were coming in one way and the Americans were coming in the other. And when we were on this, uh, coming back toward the American lines, in April of 45, the guards would tell us where we could stay, where we were going to stay at the night. And if it happened, so the weather wasn't too bad, and we would just stay where we had to carry everything on our backs. And every evening, I get my tail gun and I got shot down two days, but he got shot down on my Swineford raid two days before I did. But when we, when we got to, in the Stalag 17, we got together and uh, he was from Kansas City. And uh, he would take my uh, bed in and my backpack where we were going out at night, and I'd take off to the furthest farmhouse I could find and start trading tobacco for food. And uh, people were always glad to see it. These old farmers, they would, I'd, I would never trade them a can of, of uh, tobacco. I'd give them part of a can. They'd take a little in their hand and kind of inhale it. They hadn't had any tobacco in seven years. And while they felt that Prince Albert was, was the best thing in the world, they'd been smoking Timothy Hay. And I watched one of them, he'd take a little bit of tobacco and mix it with his tim Timothy Hay and still smoke it because I didn't trade them enough to. But the, they would pull uh, things out of their, their chimneys, food like uh, uh, pork and things like that, where they had hid from the soldiers or anybody else. And uh, I always got plenty, plenty to eat along the way. One day we were coming by a field, and the people, three or four of them, were up there planting, planting potatoes. And potatoes, you have a section them up, maybe a quarter of one, or three or four pieces. And they were putting them in the, in the field. Well, I did enough, I gathered up a few of them while they were going the other way and take them down to the creek and wash them off and we got plenty to eat that way because we didn't have this had to kind of do our own thing when we were on the going back toward the American lines. The Russians were coming up from the east and the American lines were coming in from the west. And uh, all the people were trying to come towards the American lines. And some of them tried to get me to stay with them until the Russians went by. Because they knew that they thought they'd get better treatment, I guess, from the Americans. But I never did stay over with one or two nights. That's all I ever stayed out. 
for uh, a pack of cigarettes and things like that, any, anything, the guards tried to get them, see, and he, he didn't care. The first three days that we were coming out from uh, Krims, Austria, the guard told me, I guess he told the other guys too, I'm sure he did, said the SS troopers are with us. I said, stay, better stay in line. And one guy came back one day with, with a bullet, had just grazed his coat. Like that. And the boy, he got in the center of the line. He never got out. So we could, after three days, he said to the, the SS trooper from with us. So then I started going out, and he you know where we could stop. And the, uh, uh, I trade with the people. When the Russians came into Vienna, they started moving us back toward the American lines in groups of 500. And then they had, they had, we had some two or three guards on 500 always. And uh, after we got away from uh, the Danube area, they just kept taking us along. And that's when I would get out and go visit with the civilians. What town I went into, and uh, the card was right there, and they've got, a gal threw me a potato, you know. Sometimes you got there and get a little hungry because the Germans didn't feed us anything. They may have tried to once or twice, but I had better food. I would go out trading bring it in. Eggs were uh, pretty valuable and I, I treated a little tobacco for eggs and things like that. And uh, this girl threw me a potato and this, this card looked at her, he could have shot her. You see, they had, they had the ability, I mean the permission and all that to do anything they wanted to, those German guards did. And, I was uh, in, I think, the same town, and I had a bar of the Sweetheart Soap. My folks had sent me uh, kind of a care package. It was toothpaste and all those things in there, and it was about to be a bar there. And I just smell of it, you know. I thought, this might uh, come in handy with the right person. So we were negotiating with uh, these two two or three of these gals and uh, I finally got up nine eggs. They gave me nine eggs for that. I let them smell it, you know, smell it. <laughs> it's stuck there. And I finally got nine eggs out of it. But that was the most valuable thing except for Prince Albert in the can. The war was over the third of May. I believe the second, first or second of May, we woke up one morning and the third and the seventh army had overlapped and they came in there and a little boy in the seventh army came in there and said, you guys are free. We scattered like a bunch of quail. I went to a town, started to do it west toward the American line because I didn't speak Russian not well enough to head back to my homestead. So um, I started walking, oh, it must have been 50 of guys going along. There came an old boy in a wagon, and one horse was way ahead of the other, and uh, I got on the wagon with me. He said, you know how to drive a, a horse in a wagon? I said, sure, I did. I lived on a ranch when I was growing up, but we always had horses in the wagon. So I got a road we went into this town and I tied the horses up outside so that the farmer could, could get them, you know. Walked into this uh, town and it was kind of shot up. And one of this old sergeant, he said, uh, I identified myself. He said, don't you be going around this town without a gun. And he said, down on this corner here, you'll find a whole stack of guns. You pick out one. Down on the next block of where you'll find a lot of ammo. You get your gun. Don't be caught without a gun. So 
Covenant and our family are over and the under. Rifle, hunting rifle. I uh, went on down and I found some shells that fit. And the, in the process, someplace uh, somebody had stashed away a good, pretty good bicycle. So I liberated that. I didn't. I knew they were quick going in place that day anyway. So I got my rifle and my ammo and uh, bicycle. Headed back toward the camp. Rode on back to camp and they they moved everybody out. They said they were going to fly us into France. Well, I had this uh, good bicycle. It was a good. One. So. I looked it up and it was 40 kilometers to um, some well-known town back be kind of southeast of Brown Knoll. What is it? It's a music. I can't think of what the name of it. But it says 40 yeah. kilometers. I thought, well, this right. is, bike is running pretty good. And I'm going to head down that way because I knew I had a few free days. I went by a farmhouse and a dozen guys ran out with a, with a German uniform, but they had a big H sewed on their collar. And you could tell it was just freshly sewn on there. And I didn't, didn't know enough about what was going on, but they were Hungarians. And when Germany went into Hungary, you, they told these young, young guys, you'll either get shot or you join up. Them. And they they cock out with their hands up. They all wanted to surrender to me. And I thought I got looking at my road map and decided I might be going the wrong direction here, you know, because I was the head of the army. So I put that bike in reverse and went on back. And the uh, next day, or that day, maybe later, yeah, later that day, running to American soldiers in this town. And he happened to be from the same town where my folks were living here, Bronk. And he knew my sisters. And we got acquainted. And he said, uh, yeah, I'll put you up tonight at his favorite hotel. He'd confiscated a room, a three-story building at a house. And he said, you can stay there. So I went to his place and he said now don't go to that toilet on the first floor because it's booby trapped. So we went on up to there and he had a bed and threw out a, uh, a feather mattress on the floor. The Germans always slept, they had a pretty good house. So. And I slept on that thing and it was the most uncomfortable night I ever spent. I just couldn't get used to it, so. Because I'd been sleeping on my uh, favorite, <laughs> any place I could. We used to, we sleep on the ground two or three times. One time on, when I was marching back there, we found a barn, and there was a bunch of old hens were scared up in there, and uh, started looking for the eggs. Found a lot of eggs where they laid. I'm sure the people didn't want them, so we had them for breakfast. Coburn and I was frying eggs one morning. Coburn wasn't much of an outdoorsman. And I'd bring, of course, to divide all my food with him and all that, because he carried my backpack for a few miles. And uh, to me, it was all well and good, and they flew to the, they flew us back into France. Can't think of the camp thing. And uh, they said, now, don't you boys eat, drink anything at all around here. You eat what we give you because your stomach is in bad shape. And uh, I'm sure they were right. I'm sure they knew what they were doing. But uh, they said, you stay here now for about 10 days and we'll uh, get you in a good health and all that. And this friend of mine talked me into going to a local 
refreshment center there. And it, about the dark, they ran out of it. They served us some stuff. That, he said it was bay rum. And I had never tasted the bay rum, so I guess it maybe was. We started back to where Camp Lucky Strike is where we were. And uh, we were just walking across the way, and there was a, a Frenchman out there. He was waving his arms. I thought he was greeting us. We got over to see what he was. He said, you crazy American, that's a minefield you just walked over. <laughs> we said, oh, well, these French are funny people, you know. <laughs> Make all kinds of sigh. And we got over there, and he told us that. So we were going back there where we had, because we were, we've been there two or three days, and uh, there was a bunch of soldiers standing in Reveille. They worked there at Camp Lucky Strike. Behind them there, there was a pile of chicken about that high. But Clem and I went in there and kind of helped ourselves and turned around with another tent and ran into a, a officer. He said, what the hell are you guys trying to do? So oh, we've been in a prison camp. We just couldn't resist stealing so much chicken. He said, "Did you get enough?" We had no handle. We had this loose, and we'd steal a roll loaf of bread every night. That bread would taste um, just like cake does now, you know, because we hadn't had enough sugar for. You know. <laughs> then, then uh, I decided. It's getting pretty confined out there. Took any restrictions, so I caught a truck into uh, Paris, and uh, this truck driver said, "Do you have a pass?" I said, "No, I lost it." He said, "Don't worry, I got one." We went into where uh, Joan of Arc. We went through this town, Joan of Arc. We went into Paris. And I went in and took a shower at a place and uh, started gradually working my way back to camp and uh, came to this place where Joan of Arc was buried. It's where they make this uh, real fancy wine, too. The priests make it. I can't remember the town. I can't remember the name of the of the wine now. I didn't go out and see her grave, but I've been close. Got back, and Eisenhower was making a speech over in a few tents from where we were. But we had a good, good poker game going, and uh, some of the people that I knew, they were leaving, and they gave me a few French francs and, we, and I didn't even get to go over and greet Eisenhower. Had I known he'd be a president, maybe I'd broke up a, instead of going to the poker game, I'd have stayed with him. Then they said, if, we go to, if anybody wants to go to England, they told us where to go and get the, you know, or where did you want to go to the States? Of course, I wanted to get back to see Lillian as quick as I could, but uh, I detoured back and went to my old outfit and played a few hands with them and uh, saw Joan. I stayed over there for a month. Then the order came. Any American without papers up to date, they're going to start picking them up. So I thought, well, maybe I better go. Back home. So I went to Southampton, and 12 days later we landed in beautiful harbor in Boston, which was the dirtiest, dirty place I'd ever been. And we kept us out there all night. And then the next day they put us on the bus, gave us some orders and things, and came on down to New York. I had to change to train there. Came on down. Next place I got off was in Taylor, Texas. My mom and dad were down there and my sister 
two of my sisters were there. And I kept messing around in San Antonio. And then finally, the 1st of November, they gave me a uh, discharge. And ended my career. I started it, kind of started it, I guess, because I fell away to Alpine and sugar, sugar baby. Some of the American prisoners, when uh, the Germans surrendered to them, they either had an egg or something in their pocket, they'd mash it, you know, just for their convenience. And uh, I, never, I never had any ill feeling to any of them. They figured everybody was trying to do their job like I was. But it was, it was all interesting. After my junior year of high school, I went to, I was ill in this part of the country with allergies. So I went to Valentine, Texas, out in West Texas, to visit my aunt. And when I was there, uh, Leo and his family worked with my aunt and uncle. So I went, while I was with my aunt, she uh, had a visitor one day, and uh, Leo came by. And she said, let's uh, have a picnic and go out on the hill and have a picnic. So she made a picnic lunch, and the three of us went out to have a picnic. I was 15, he was 23. And uh, on the hillside came a cloudburst just as we got ready to eat our picnic lunch. And so we headed home in a hurry, and we came to an arroyo that had been dry, but it was running swift and wide. So Leo jumped across it and uh, he reached out to my aunt and he said, put your hand out, I'll pull you and you jump. And they did and she came across. So then he put his hand out to me and he said, jump and I'll pull. I jumped and he didn't pull. And I landed in the water and 67 years later I'm trying to get even with him. <laughs> So that's how I met him, and then continued, I met his family and continued to know about his military life after that. I first started getting the letters several months after that. I had a birthday after I heard that he was missing. I got a birthday card from him, but it was three months late. So it took a long time to get communication back and forth. And uh, after that, we wrote occasionally. He would write about the the prison camp and I wrote to him about things that were going on in college. I was college, in college at that time. And um, uh, we had our letters censored because I tried to tell him where certain people were and the army marked that part out and it was censored. Um, I continued to hear from him until he was liberated. When he came back in August of 1945, he came to the college where I was going to school in Alpine. And he, he drove in in a 1939 Plymouth with four airplane tires. And he asked me if I'd like to go to Big Bend, Texas, which was about 90 miles away. So I said yes, I cut a class had missed a test, and we went to the Big Ben for the day and came back. And then he could, this was um, August of 1945, and uh, we continued to get back and forth. Thanksgiving came down to see our families. Um, were married in San Angelo, Texas in 1944. At the first time he mentioned, he said, you know you're going to marry me, and I thought, yeah, sure. <laughs> but it, it kind of grew into this, but Thanksgiving, when we came to visit the families, uh, I knew his family because I'd met him years before, and uh, he knew my family, so we came to visit both of them, and uh, on the way back, I had become sick, so he took me back to Alpine, and we left early in the morning and uh, stopped off, I guess maybe you'd say the closest to asking me to marry him. Uh, he said, do you think we should stop in San Angelo and buy a set of rings? So on our way back to Alpine, we bought the rings, and I, I guess it was mutual consideration at that time. 
And he took me back to Alpine, and the next thing I heard from him, he was back down in Central Texas. And he had gone to ask my mother and dad for permission to marry me. That was exactly the way it was. He came and told him maybe, I don't know, he told me he asked him. <laughs> <laughs> and then we married in December, and he started college with me in Alpine and went one semester there with me until I graduated. And then we moved to Las Cruces, New Mexico, where he finished his college work at New Mexico State. And I taught school and we lived there where or some of our kids were born. I decided that I wasn't going back to cowboy at $25 a month. And I wrote these things down that I'm going to get out of here and go to college. I'm going to join the church and I'm going to join the Masonic order if they'll take me out. And in the meantime, stopped off at Alpine before and got acquainted with her before I did accomplished all these other things. Life has been good to me. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Will and Lillian Perkins. You must remember this, a kiss is just a kiss, a sigh is just a sigh. The fundamental things apply as time goes by and when two lovers woo they still say I love you on that you can rely no matter what the future brings as time goes by songs never out of date hearts full of passion jealousy and hate woman need man and man must have his mate that no one can deny it's still the same old story a fight for love and glory a case of do or die the world will always welcome lovers as time 